and we've, we've tried to look at the ways that this com, uh, concept has emerged in shaping an operational definition, something that would be useful for looking at the way international institutions can more tangibly deliver on human dignity. The ancients, for instance, um, looked at various aspects of human dignity. Um, Aristotle looked at the concept of eudaimonia, which essentially refers to human flourishing, a concept which we'll see later in a very modern time has been picked up on by international institutions. Other thinkers uh, in ancient times looked at a concept of thymos, or spiritedness of people, having to do with realizing one's potential. Of course, here at a Jesuit university, it's proper for us to think of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, we'll hear more about this from Tom Banchoff um, over lunch. Um, but the, the special value of each person created uh, in the image of the creator is a concept that has been drawn by later moderns to inform human dignity. We draw fairly heavily on the thinking of Immanuel Kant that no person should be treated as a mere means, that every individual has special value. And then, of course, since World War II, much of the human rights work of multilateral institutions and treaties has alluded to human dignity. In fact, alluded to it to some respect as this pre-existing concept, this thing that comes before human rights, as Professor Aaron has, has referred to. Most notably, in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, I really commend to you Marianne Glendon's book about the drafting of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the special role played by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we look at some more modern um, theorists of international law. For instance, Myers McDougall at the Yale Law School, crafting something that some people refer to as the New Haven School, a jurisprudential theory which places central importance on realization of human dignity, that constructs in international law ought to be designed to promote that. Now, many people will say that that was caught in a legacy of the Cold War and was a formulation designed to explain the agenda of the free world, um, but it explicitly raises up human dignity in the context of international law. Importantly, for those of you who are engaged in the study of development or working at uh, multilateral um, development banks, the UN Development Program, based in large part on the thinking of Amartya Sen, um, had put uh, forward a framework for trying to um, build upon the capabilities of people, realization of a sense of a whole person and their capabilities. And in fact, the existence of the Global Human Development Program builds on this notion that there is a broader set of capabilities, um, even more um, holistic than, than mere economic prosperity and economic development. And the whole United Nations Human Development Report has been based on this concept of capabilities, which in many ways picks up on the notion of human flourishing from Aristotle. Um, I'm most influenced in this effort to look at traditions at some thinking by Francis Fukuyama. You'll recall the famous article and book, The End of History, the book The End of History and the Last Man, which suggested that at the end of the Cold War, the great ideological struggle of East and West would be transcended. There'd be kind of a Hegelian dialectic, and you'd get um, you know, reach uh, a stage where there would no longer be a great clash of ideas and democracy or notions of democratic governance would prevail. Well, they clearly haven't uh, robustly prevailed everywhere in the world. But in his work, Fukuyama stresses that concept from the ancients of thymos. And that spiritedness, he interprets in a rather different way actually a way that's influenced by the Galian <coughs> that all human beings crave for recognition, crave for their special, unique identity. Our friend Todd Lindbergh, 
uh, and this project has noted, of course, there's a dark side to that. Mm -hmm. Those who crave for recognition sometimes are those who carry out atrocities uh, and ethnic cleansing. Um, but that struggle for recognition lies at the center um, of the thrust of history. And so from these ideas in the past, we form an operational definition of dignity. It is, again, incumbent on us, if we are to talk about international institutions delivering on dignity for people, that we have something specific that could be more operationalized, go beyond laws on paper and treaties, but implement it. And so the two elements of our working at a definition of dignity are agency and social recognition. Agency is at the heart of this idea of human flourishing and capabilities, that every individual should be able to use their gifts, to use religious language, to use their gifts and flourish. And that if they lack agency, they're being denied dignity. But the other element that is really essential for this is social recognition. It's not just that people are valuable. They need to be recognized as valuable in a social context. You cannot look at individuals strictly in terms of them being innately valuable. But they must feel in a social context that they're recognized. So that no single group of women or children or minorities or particular racial group, or those of disadvantaged castes in India, etc., are written off in terms of their value or their access to justice, agency, and social recognition. <laughs>